This week, to be closer to China, the Communist Party of China, the CPC, has been China's ruling party for 70 years. From founding of the PRC to carrying out reform and opening up, from vowing to eliminate poverty to leading the country in all aspects, how has the CPC brought about China's remarkable development? We have a very strong education system, a very strong education system, a very strong education system. And what's the relationship between the Communist Party of China and rule of law in China? While China still has a lot of work to do in developing and establishing the rule of law, any sober assessment of the past 40 years has to acknowledge the, the uh, tremendous advances that have been made. This week, understand the CPC to be closer to China. Founded in 1921, the Communist Party of China, the CPC, has been engaged in China's political arena for almost a century, and it has been leading the country for just about 70 years. Most foreigners do not understand the CPC, especially its historic transformation from a revolutionary party seeking power to a ruling party exercising power. China is now at a multidimensional crossroads, rightly described as a new era. Outcomes affect the entire world as well as China, and the only way to grasp China's current conditions and to anticipate China's future prospects is to understand what the CPC is and how it works. In general, it's worse than foreigners not understanding the CPC. Foreigners in general feel no need to do so. This is a mistake. Because in order to understand China today, one must understand the CPC today. So, if the world does not understand the CPC, then the CPC should reach out to the world. The veil should be lifted. Why has China opted for one-party leadership? What should the CPC be and continue to be the ruling party? How to build party institutions that are self-correcting and can endure? Addressing these questions gets us closer to China. Linxian County, located on the plateau in central China's Shanxi province, has a fragile ecosystem with severe soil erosion. The population of Linxian exceeds 600,000, with a third living in poverty. Zhang Jianguo is the county party secretary. Linxian is one of 13 counties under the jurisdiction of Luliang Municipality, a prefecture-level city in Shaanxi Province. So we must have the five-year-olds to be the top the five levels of CPC secretaries are the party leaders at the provincial, city, county, township, and village levels. I deeply appreciate how the CPC has done something unique in human history in terms of the anti-poverty campaign. So what is it about the CPC in China that differs 
from one-party systems that we find in other places of the world, particularly the developing world. First, the CPC is a leadership which is able to mobilize a huge population. Second, the CPC has a strong administrative capacity, which has been hard won. In the past, our party had good proposals but lacked the administrative capacity to execute them. Now, General Secretary Xi Jinping strongly emphasizes administrative capacity, focusing on addressing the last mile challenges and implementing a good blueprint to follow. Third, we have the ability to correct mistakes. There are indeed functionaries who siphon off funds meant to help the poor. Whoever does this will be brought to justice. Lastly, we have strategic resolve and focus. For example, party secretaries of impoverished counties will stay there until poverty is finally alleviated. Thus, all party members, the whole nation, are jointly addressing these poverty issues together with aligned thinking and actions. The party has enjoyed a number of historical advantages as well as older civilizational values, uh, as well as, you know, civilizational expectations that have helped to limit such problems relative to other one-party systems. Uh, additionally, uh, despite being the largest mass political organization in the world, it is most notable for its capacity for organizing, uh, for, for its capacity for organization and mobilization, including its ability to reach uh, and implement uh, uh, executive decisions, its capacity to learn from mistakes stakes, and when necessary, uh, its ability to make major changes in how it governs itself and others. Uh, finally, it has a history of, di of, of uh, disciplining itself uh, for the good of national advancement. This has led to the institutionaliz uh, institutionalization of various practices frequently associated with meritocracy and which have helped to limit problems like corruption, nepotism, and so on. China under CPC leadership has astonished the world by lifting over 750 million people out of extreme poverty, the most dramatic poverty alleviation success story in human history. Moreover, Party General Secretary Xi Jinping has pledged to eliminate all extreme poverty by 2020, which is required for China to achieve a moderately prosperous society, the country's first centennial goal, the 100th anniversary of the CPC, which was founded in 1921. In addition to solving the unsolvable problem of extreme poverty, what are other reasons why the CPC has maintained its ruling party status over the past seven decades? By what um, uh, legitimacy or by what source does the CPC uh, have perpetual rule in China? The CPC differs from other political parties of the world and other communist parties in that it has its own cognition, awareness and requirements. The so-called self-awareness is manifested by defining the CPC as two vanguards, describing the party constitution as vanguards of both the Chinese working class and also the Chinese people and Chinese nation. Second, the CPC's self-awareness has its own characteristics. The so-called self-awareness refers to the guiding thoughts of the CPC, which serves as an ideological banner for political parties. Communist parties in other countries are guided by Marxism and Leninism. The CPC, besides upholding Marxism as its fundamental guiding ideology, emphasizes integrating it with China's actual conditions and to essentially synthesize Marxism. It emphasizes cynicization, nationalization, and popularization. Of course, the CBC also keeps pace with the times. Third, the CBC's self-requirements are different. The CBC requires itself to serve the people and seek truth from facts. It upholds justice for the people and is ready to correct any mistakes for the people. The CBC imposes strict self-discipline and strict governance of the party. I appreciate the analysis that roots the legitimacy of the CPC in the revolution, in the founding of the People's Republic uh, at the time, which was a very uh, serious time for China in terms of its uh, condition. One can't claim that a, a legitimacy at one point in history, now 70 years ago, uh, would that legitimacy would last forever? 
First, it's important to set out the correct policies and guidelines in light of China's actual conditions. The second is to identify the goals proceeding from the fundamental interests of the Chinese people. The combination of these two is known as the ideological line of the CPC, which enables the CPC to formulate the correct line, principles and policies to find the proper way forward amid various complicated situations and to correct its own mistakes. Let me tell you how I answer questions about the party when I'm asked in the West, as, as I am often. Uh, the first thing I say is that when you use the English term party or political party to begin to describe the CPC, you are already in the, in the wrong territory. Because to use the term political party con connotes in Western minds a whole separate system in, a, in the Western political system. And that's not what the party is here by representing all the people. So one analogy I use, it's not, certainly not perfect, but one thing I say is this, uh, to people in the United States is that try to imagine that the um, either Democratic or Republican Party had within it all the lobbyists in Washington representing all the different industries, uh, 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 groups of all different kinds, all within the same party. It, it would be a totally different thing because the lobbyist system in Washington represents collectively all the different interests in the United States. So I, try, I said try to imagine all the lobbyists within a, one party and you can begin to understand what the CPC is. But I always say that if, if you use the term party and political party in the old sense, that was the way the CPC started because, as you said, there were hundreds of parties, so it started that way. But now as the ruling party, especially after 70 years, it has a totally different character. So I said it really should have a different name other than political party. You may not agree, but I'd love to hear your opinion. What I want to tell you is that the concept is evolving and the party is evolving as well. The concept of party itself is supposed to be updated. Like you said, the West defines party or political party based on certain connotations and denotations. As time wears on, however, the party embodies more diverse aspects, and the concept of party itself should be upgraded. From our perspectives, as practices and reality change, theories and concepts should go hand in hand to reflect the changes. I think there are four important differences. First, the CPC is a long-term ruling party whose legitimacy is codified in our constitution. This differs greatly from the West's rounds of reshuffling with general elections. Second, the groups of people represented by the CPC may differ from those in the West. The CPC safeguards the ultimate interests of the general public and continues to improve its mechanisms and institutions to represent the fundamental interests of the vast majority of people. The third difference lies in the party's ruling principle. Because the CPC enjoys long-term rule in China, it's convenient for us to unify our long-term and short-term goals divided according to different development stages. This also explains the many five-year plans in China, from the first five-year plan to the second, the third, and today, the 13th five-year plan. How can the CPC keep moving forward without coming to a halt in the middle or seeing governing goals break down into pieces like in certain other countries? The reason is that China is implementing the CPC governing goals based on different development stages. The fourth point is that if there's a major difference between the CPC and the Western ruling party, I believe that will be the power relied upon. In China, we govern by the people and for the people. And so the single most significant philosophy in our governance is the mass line that we take as the lifeline and guiding principle for the CPC. Number 76, Xingye Road, Huangpu District in Shanghai, is a typical Shanghai-style Shikuman architecture. In 1921, the first National Congress of the Communist Party of China was held here. From being an organizational army of the Chinese working class in its early days, 
After representing the fundamental interests of the great majority of the people since the new century, to providing enhanced leadership in the new era, the CPC develops its mass base for each historical period consistent with social conditions. Being the ruling party does not necessarily mean that the CPC's ruling status cannot be challenged. CPC General Secretary Xi Jinping stressed the significance of party governance in 2016 when commemorating the 95th anniversary of the founding of the CPC. He emphasized that if the CPC cannot be managed effectively, it would eventually lose the right to govern and thus be unavoidably eliminated by history. In the same year, at the sixth plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee, the party promoted comprehensive and strict governance by passing the Regulation on Intra-Party Supervision, which dedicates one chapter to the supervision of the party's central organization. We must remain alert at all times and prepare for potential dangers. Today, the CPC's governance is legitimate because it has the people's support. Will people support the party forever? It depends on whether the CPC can continue to represent the people and the interests of the people and do a great job like it is now. Only in this way can we retain the people's support. Otherwise, without strong party building, a troubled CPC would lose the recognition and support of the people and may not sustain long-term governance. We are soberly aware that for the CPC to sustain long-term governance, the CPC must maintain its progressiveness and purity and always represent the fundamental interests of the Chinese people and keep in close touch with the masses. You mentioned rightly that by correcting its mistakes, the CPC justifies its rule. I totally agree with that. The issue comes with the one-party system that it sometimes takes a lot of time to do that. The uh, Great Leap Forward you mentioned was three years with uh, severe consequences. The Cultural Revolution was 10 years. And even the corruption during the time of op uh, uh, reform and opening up arguably could be said was growing for maybe two decades until um, President Xi Jinping's leadership began a relentless campaign against it. So the question is, with a one-party system, how do you uh, accelerate the checks and balances so that problems when they occurred can be dealt with much quicker, uh, especially in the new era when the dynamism of the world is so intense? 这个问题呢, this is a major issue that we have been thinking about. The solution is institutionalization and legalization. The CBC is to serve the people without seeking personal gains. That said, it doesn't guarantee that no mistakes will be made. In particular, the leadership in the party tends to play a very significant role. Inappropriate decisions made at the leadership level would result in big problems and it is particularly hard to correct mistakes from the bottom up. Therefore, we need to improve democratic centralism within the party. Based on research, views are solicited repeatedly before major decisions are made. Over the past 40 years of reform and opening up, before each plenary session and major decision-making, opinions are fully solicited within the party to ensure no fatal mistakes. This is the first point, democratic centralism within the party. Secondly, the political party system is to be upgraded. The CPC represents the leading core, but it is not enough to rely on one single party. China's party system is unique in the world. It is neither a multi-party system nor a two-party system, nor the one-party rule like the former Soviet Union. But rather, it is a CPC-led multi-party cooperation and political consultation. Besides the CPC, we have eight other democratic parties. This is a historical legacy for us. We must use it well and fully engage all democratic parties in major decision making. All democratic parties proceeding from actual conditions and from the classes and masses they connect with are to help the CPC make good decisions and supervise the CPC to correct mistakes. This is the second point about the party system. Thirdly is the people's democratic system. It is most important for the people to supervise the CPC. 
People choose delegates to the National People's Congress to join the governance of China by offering their views on major proposals. What is more, supervision by public opinion and society reflect people's appeals and dissatisfaction, which are directly heard at the county, township and village levels. Finally, all the above is to be written into laws. Regarding the anti-corruption campaign within the party, um, I've heard Chinese officials say that the only purpose of it is because the officials are corrupt. Uh, Western media, of course, would say that the only purpose is political struggle or uh, disposing of rivals, etc. In my opinion, conflicts within a party are unavoidable. There is no reason to deny that. Different proposals and paths coexist, right? The CBC is a big party converging diverse groups with varying interests. Certain things are difficult to be avoided. However, the party itself has no particular interests. It is a handful of people within the party who have their own considerations of interest. Some did seek their own private gains. We must acknowledge this reality. The anti-corruption campaign, however, is not a conflict within the party or an inner party struggle to get rid of dissidents. The inner party struggle in its broad sense is a struggle of inner party contradictions and problems. In its narrowest sense, the inner party struggle is people with power excluding dissidents in the name of precaution, which is not what we want. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, corruption varies in its forms. It is not all about financial corruption. Take several major cases, for example, like Zhou Yunkang, Bo Xilai, and Ling Jihua, who were financially corrupt with a corrupt lifestyle, which mainly resulted from political corruption with no ideals or beliefs, and forged cliques to seek power. In the end, it's all about corruption. Anti-corruption efforts to stop such activities cannot be regarded as an inner party struggle because such corruption goes against the fundamental purposes of the CPC and the party principle and spirit. Well, factionalism, particularly in large parties and large states, is impossible to avoid. It can emerge from ideological differences, competing economic needs and interests, local versus national concerns, regionalism, and so on. Nevertheless, uh, one of the key objectives of a Leninist party is to limit the extent to which factionalism weakens the party, or worse, leads it to split and lose power. Therefore, while the existence of formal factions is often taboo in a Leninist party, the system is in fact designed to deal with them. In other words, because they exist, there's a mechanism to deal with them, right? Because they're unavoidable, the party has been built precisely to deal with them. Now, from the party's earliest days, there have been differences of opinion, and these have emerged as recognizable factions. Sometimes they were, these were merely patronage networks, special interest groups, and so on, but they can also result in unhealthy competitions for power when it comes to accelerating the advancement of the national reform agenda, social justice, and so on. Furthermore, sometimes these groups also become especially corrupt. Now, historically, the party has employed several mechanisms simultaneously to limit these problems, and while they varied uh, how they've used them uh, in tandem, uh, they have included democratic centralism, collective leadership around a core, intra-party democracy, and party discipline. They have also been positively influenced by concepts and practices associated with new democracy and the mass line, as well as the underlying uh, Marxist concerns for collective social justice. What's the relationship between the Communist Party of China and rule of law in China? The conventional wisdom in the West is that the party is above the law. The law was promulgated under the leadership of the CPC, and also the CPC takes the lead to abide by the law. Here is the difference between the rule of law and rule by law. Regarding rule by law, the CPC uses the law as a means to govern the people. This is rule by law. However, what we uphold is the rule of law. That is, the CPC stipulates the laws and also takes the lead to follow them. While China has much to learn from others when it comes to establishing the rule of law, there are many points to consider. First, in actual practice, many Western countries do not excel in the rule of law themselves despite being vocal critics of China. Second, while China still has a lot of work to do in developing and establishing the rule of law, 
any sober assessment of the past 40 years has to acknowledge the, the uh, tremendous advances that have been made. Is the CBC above the law or vice versa? The question itself is a pseudo proposition as the CBC led the people to formulate the constitution and laws. And the CBC exercises power within the limits prescribed by the constitution and laws. The party is an organization, while the law is a code of conduct. The two cannot be compared. Our understanding of law has gone through a process. In the past, we had our constitution and laws, but failed to treat them seriously until the third plenary session of the 11th CPC Central Committee, when Deng Xiaoping pointed out that democracy has to be written into law and institutionalized given the mistakes made by Chairman Mao Zedong to make sure institutions and laws do not change whenever leaders change their views. The building of the legal system was emphasized. Under General Secretary Xi's leadership, we have launched a comprehensive program of ruling the country according to law. In other words, we're underlining the CBC's leadership of everything while maintaining the people are masters of the country. How to handle the relationship between the rule of law and the position of the people as masters of the country? It is to transform the will of the people into laws under the leadership of the CPC. The party acts within the limits prescribed by the constitution and laws and coordinates the will of the people to enact those laws with the views of the party abiding by the rule of law. More importantly, the rule of law is employed to supervise the CPC to better represent the people and lead the nation. China used to be a country of small farmers lax in discipline with a weak awareness of the rule of law. Setting the goals is not enough. We must make great efforts since we know that with a weak foundation, we need to catch up with countries with a strong tradition of rule of law enforcement. We're sparing no efforts to overcome the negative impacts left over by a small-scale peasant country by integrating democracy, law, and the CPC leadership into an organic whole. The CPC has ruled China since 1949. It has almost 90 million members. Why then does the mystery linger? Why still such archaic perceptions of the CPC? Perhaps remembrances of the collapsed Soviet Communist Party, hidden and sclerotic, or imprints of China during the Cultural Revolution, fanatical and chaotic, both of which could cloud comprehension of the contemporary CPC. Whatever the reasons, the veil of mystery is now being lifted. The CPC has become proactive in opening its window and its door to the world. Two unambiguous facts confounds its critics. The CPC has led China in its historic sustained development, lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty and rejuvenating the nation as a global power. And the CPC continues to be, after 70 years, China's uncontested ruling party. The two facts are not unrelated. One orienting principle to really get what the CPC is all about is to decouple the CPC from Western ideas of a political party. In order to represent all the people, and in order to maintain leadership, the CPC must embed and express within itself all aspects of society, which is no mean task given the complexity of contemporary life. The CPC ideal then is national representation and ultimate meritocracy, both in the broadest sense. Next week, we continue to understand the CPC in order to keep closer to China.